In this short video, we're going to revisit our spring mass system, but this time we're going to add some damping. Now this makes it realistic. When you have a uh, spring and you release it, it doesn't oscillate forever uh, because of some friction or some other forces which cause it to slowly stop oscillating. That's what we call damping. So damping is actually very difficult to model correctly. Uh, the usual assumption in some cases is that it is proportional to some power of the velocity. And for our case, we're just going to assume that it's proportional to the velocity raised to the power of one. This is referred to as viscous damping. So our beta is just a uh, constant of proportionality. If we add that in, so this is now we have a new force. Uh, it is going to be opposing the motion. So that's why I have that negative sign on there. And so just dividing through by m, we'll get this equation. But for our analysis, it's going to be useful to replace the coefficient on the velocity term, so the dx dt. We're going to replace beta over m with 2 lambda. So lambda is now just a dummy parameter to help us understand the system better. And we're going to replace uh, k over m with omega squared, as we did with free undamped motion. So our new uh, differential equation would have this form. And our auxiliary equation now is going to give us, uh, remember, m is just the dummy variable for the auxiliary equation. It's not mass. So m is going to be negative lambda plus or minus radical lambda squared minus omega squared. So that means there's going to be three cases based on what value we have under the radical sign. We've seen this before. Um, certainly one thing that's, that's true is that every solution, no matter what happens under the radical, is going to include a factor of e to the negative lambda t, which tells us that uh, as t gets larger, this multiplying factor is going to get smaller. In fact, it's going to get smaller quick, very quickly. And so the displacement becomes negligible after a certain period of time. So let's go through the cases. Our first case would be when I have a positive number under the radical sign. Uh, this system is called overdamped because our damping constant is large relative to the spring constant. And our solution then is just going to have two exponentials. And then we'll have another exponential on the outside. Um, you can see that uh, lambda squared minus omega squared. And when I take the square root of that, that's going to be smaller than lambda. So uh, if I multiply these out, then I'm going to have a a net negative exponent, uh, which is what we would expect. As t goes to infinity, then the displacement of x is just going to go to 0. And so this says it's not going to oscillate. You're going to release it. You're going to uh, the spring. And essentially, it's just going to come to a stop. In case 2, we have 0 under the radical sign. And so we just have uh, an, an exponential with a negative exponent and um, multiplied by a constant plus uh, a constant times t, so some linear function. So it, it's uh, almost impossible to have a critically damped system uh, in reality. Uh, what it says is that any tiny increase in damping will result in an oscillator, os, oscillatory motion. 
And so um, it may have uh, critically damped uh, behavior for a very short period of time, but it will eventually start to oscillate. So in case three, we have a negative number under the radical sign, and that's telling us that we have an underdamped system, which means that the damping coefficient is relatively small compared to the spring constant. This is a, a really practical uh, situation. Uh, generally, things that we may in, in structural analysis, uh, objects that you're studying are generally very stiff, uh, and they have a relatively small uh, damping constant. So here you have some oscillatory motion, but the uh, displacement or the period of the motion is decreasing exponentially. So let's look at an example. So here we've got a damping constant um, related uh, proportional to five. And the spring constant is proportional to four. We had, we're given some initial conditions. Um, this means that the object, so x of zero equals one. So it's one unit below the equilibrium position or the rest position. And it's imported with a positive, imparted with a positive velocity, which means that it is actually uh, being uh, pushed downward with an initial velocity of one. Remember, downward is positive. So if I look at the auxiliary equation, we can get two uh, real distinct roots. This is an overdamped system. And so our solution to the DE is the sum of these two exponential functions. And we can evaluate the uh, initial conditions or impose the initial conditions to find the value of the constants. The second initial condition uh, is relies on the first derivative. So we'll go ahead and take that first derivative. We get a system of equations here where c1 and c2 are the variables. And uh, from that system, we can find that c2 is negative 2 thirds and c1 is 5 thirds. And that gives us the equation of motion. All right, so here we're given another example. We're told its weight, which is eight pounds. Eight pounds would be a quarter of a slug. It stretches a spring two feet. So that should be enough information to calculate the spring constant. We're told that the Damping force is going to be 2 times dx dt. And we'd like to find the equation of motion given that the object is released from the equilibrium position with an upward velocity of 3 feet per second. So Hooke's law will help us determine the spring constant from the information that's given. Its weight has to equal the restoring force of the spring. And that gives us a constant, spring constant of k equals 4. We can go ahead and set up our differential equation. We include the damping force. We'll go ahead and write that in standard form by multiplying through by 4. We get the auxiliary equation, which tells us that we have a repeated uh, root of the auxiliary equation of negative 4. So we're going to have, a, a, as a solution to the DE, we'll have the uh, exponential function being multiplied by a linear function. So it'll be uh, c1 plus c2 times t. So our initial conditions then tell us that uh, we're, it's starting from the equilibrium position, so uh, 
the initial displacement is zero. So C1 will have to be zero. And then in order to take advantage of the second initial condition, we need the derivative. So let's take the derivative and say that, oh, the initial condition, uh, so we're given an upward velocity, upward would be negative. Remember, down is positive in this model. So x prime of zero is negative three. And that gives us C2 equals negative three. So in this critically damped system, the equation of motion is just uh, x of t equals negative three t times e to the power of negative four t. All right. In our third example, again, we're given the weight so as 16 pounds, which would be half of a slug. It's attached to a five foot long spring. So that's the spring is five feet long before attaching the object to it. And when you do make the attachment, then the spring stretches to 8.2 feet. So that information should be enough to calculate the spring constant. Then we're told that the object is released from rest at a point two feet above the equilibrium position. So above would mean a negative displacement. And uh, from rest means that it's not imparted with any initial velocity. The initial velocity is zero. And we'd like to find the x of t. And we're going to be told that the damping force is going to equal the velocity. So we can first calculate the spring constant from Hooke's law. We'll set up our differential equation. So our damping force here is just one times the velocity. And so writing that in standard form, we can then calculate our auxiliary equation. And uh, we are going to have complex conjugate roots, uh, meaning that we have an underdamped system. So we should see oscillatory motion. And that's why we have the sines and the cosines. To find the value of C1 and C2, we'll need to use the initial condition. So we get C1 equaling negative two. And for the second initial condition, we have to take the derivative and impose the condition that the velocity at time zero is zero. That gives us the value of C2 equals negative two thirds. And we can now write down the solution to the IVP, which is the equation of motion. So the only thing that we haven't examined yet with our simple spring mass system is what if we have a forcing function which is uh, affecting the spring mass system and we'll look at that in the next video.